Hey there, I'm Mike Rugnetta. This is Crash Course Mythology, and today we're continuing with tricksters. We're going to look at the trickster as a culture hero, meaning someone whose creativity adds to the culture of the mythological world they inhabit. We're going to focus on Europe in this episode, looking specifically at Hermes, the Greek version of Tote here, and also Loki, who in today's myth actually somehow isn't the worst. Sort of. I mean, he does disguise himself as a biting fly, so he's definitely not, like, the best. <laughs> We haven't talked much about Hermes because there aren't too many myths where he's a main character. Usually he's a messenger more than a central focus. But hey, fun fact, he has a big presence in statuary. Hermes was a phallic god, and all around Greece you could find square pillars topped with a bust of his head and featuring a male member. These are called herms and were frequently placed at crossroads. Since Hermes was also the god of travelers and roads, maybe these herms were meant to point travelers in the right direction? Tricksters like Hermes are often associated with extreme sexual appetites and also with creativity, a connection which makes a lot of sense when we think back to our stories about the creation of the world. But instead of getting into all that, let's explore one of the most famous myths about Hermes, which begins when he was just a wee little baby trickster. Okay, so baby Hermes sneaks out of his cradle and kills a tortoise. I don't know what you were expecting. We're talking about tricksters. Anyway, he turns the tortoise shell into a lyre, which he starts to play, inventing lyrics to accompany his music. Pretty creative for a baby. He probably went to a Montessori school. Then Hermes gets hungry, but not for milk. He wants some meat. So he runs to Pieria, where his brother Apollo keeps his sacred cattle. Hermes steals 50 cows and hides them in a nearby cave. To get them into the cave, he makes them walk backwards, so their footprints would be difficult to follow. He also invents some backwards sandals that hide his own tracks. Again, clever baby. Hermes whips up a fire, kills two of the cows, and roasts them, but doesn't eat them, which is kind of strange since he's supposedly so hungry. Instead, he hides the meat and cowskins in the cave, throws his sandals in the river, and covers over the fire. Then he just strolls on back to his cradle. Apollo soon learns that some of his cattle are missing, and he is furious. Despite all of Hermes' stealth efforts, Apollo figures it all out and threatens to throw him into Tartarus. Hermes defends himself, saying, he's only a baby. How can he steal 50 cows? Apollo doesn't care how old his brother is, but he can't punish Hermes without some judgment from their dad. Zeus listens to Hermes' denials, but doesn't believe him and orders the baby to bring back all those poor cows. Afterward, Hermes and Apollo make up and they exchange gifts. Apollo gives Hermes a whip as a symbol of cattle tending and the caduceus as a symbol of heraldry, indicating Hermes' position as messenger of the gods. Hermes gives Apollo the lyre he had invented and this becomes Apollo's symbol as a god of music. Although many tricksters seem more human or more animal than divine, Hermes is definitely supernatural. There's obviously something pretty special about this baby, who's not only an able thief, but a smooth talker and a tortoise murderer to boot. As David Leeming observes, in this myth, Hermes has the trickster qualities of deceitfulness, trickery, childishness, amorality, humor, extreme inventiveness, and great jar. It's his inventiveness that makes him a culture hero, though. His creation of the lyre is incredibly important. It becomes Apollo's main instrument and one of the symbols of his divine attributes. It's also significant because songs are one of the ways stories like this one were passed down in the ancient Greek world. And there's also something interesting about Hermes having to kill an animal to create the lyre. Perhaps it's a reminder that creation is often the flip side of destruction, that the two sometimes require each other. Either way, in this story, Hermes' mischief is basically harmless, unless you're a cow or that poor tortoise. So I guess not really harmless, just harmless by like normal deity standards. And it ultimately brings about something positive for all involved. Again, except the cows and the tortoise. It also explains the origin of a mythical artifact that defines the character of the god Apollo and the Greek culture that worshiped him. For our second story, we have another myth where the trickster's mischief impacts a whole culture. As with many Norse myths, it begins and ends with Loki who is the, well, you get it. One morning, Thor wakes up next to his beautiful wife, Sif, and sees that something is missing, her beautiful blonde hair. Sif is understandably upset, and she begs her husband to fix the problem. Thor has a sneaking suspicion, 
and heads off to see Loki. At first, Loki denies doing anything, but when Thor threatens to break every bone in Loki's body, Loki admits that yes, he'd stolen Sif's hair, he'd been hit in the mead, got to thinking, wouldn't it be funny? You know, disappearing hair? Hilarious. Unsurprisingly, Thor doesn't appreciate the humor and threatens him again with a most Norse undoing. So Loki offers to fix the problem, saying that he can get Sif even better hair. Thor agrees and lets Loki venture to the land of the dwarves. What is it with tricksters and dwarves? After that Anansi story from the last episode, I have a bad feeling about this. His first stop, the Sons of Ivaldi, three dwarves known for their ability at the forge. Loki says that the gods of Asgard know of their great ability, but that really they're only the second best craftsmen among the dwarves, behind the brothers Brock and Atri. The sons of Ivaldi declare that they will not be outdone and promise to make three treasures for the gods, one of which, Loki says, must be magical golden hair. Then Loki goes off to see Brock and Atri. You can probably see where this is headed. He tells them about what the sons of Ivaldi are going to do, and Brock, the talker, says that he and his brother can outdo those Ivaldis, no problem. Loki bets him he can't, and Brock takes the bet, but says that if the gods like his and Atri's treasures best, Brock gets to take Loki's head. Loki accepts. Atri, the master craftsman amongst the two brothers, tells Brock to man the bellows and to keep pumping no matter what so the temperature of their forge remains constant. Brock keeps up his pumping for the first two treasures, despite being bitten on the hand and then the neck by a large pesky fly, who is of course Loki. By the time Atri is working on the third project, Loki the fly is really beginning to worry that he might lose the bet, so he starts biting Brock's eyebrows. At one point, Brock brushes the blood from his eyes and just for a second, breaks his rhythm. When Atri finishes making the treasure, he chastises his brother for the imperfections caused by his erratic oxygenating, but says that his gift will have to do. Loki brings the Ivaldi's treasures back to Asgard. Brock brings his and his brothers. Loki reveals his treasures first, and we reveal the thought bubble to see who wins. The first treasure is Sif's new head of hair made from gold. When she puts the wig on, it fuses with her scalp and behaves like real hair. She is ecstatic, the gods are impressed. Next, Loki presents Odin with a spear, Gungnir. When thrown, it always hits its mark, useful for an old one-eyed god with suspect aim. Also, any oath sworn on Gungnir is unbreakable. Odin is pleased, but not effusive in his praise. Classic dad move. The final treasure is for Freyr, brother of Freya, who we've discussed in the past. This treasure looks like a handkerchief, but when unfolded, it becomes Skithblathnir, a magic boat big enough to carry all of the Aesir, and it'll always have a fair wind. Pretty great for a seagoing people. Loki is pleased, but Brock is still confident that his gifts will be better. First, he unveils a golden bristled boar, Gulenbursti. It glows in the dark, pulls Freyr's chariot, runs over water, and goes faster than any horse. Freyr is pleased, but Loki says it's nothing compared to a folding ship, which is just, I mean, come on, it's a glowing chariot boar. The next gift is a golden armband called Dropnir, which Odin wears. Dropnir multiplies itself. Every night, eight identical rings drip from it, greatly enriching its owner. Why gods need gold is a bit beyond me, frankly, but hey, Odin psyched. The last gift is Atri's third project, the one erratically oxygenated. It's a hammer. And even Brock has to admit that the handle is a little too short, but that doesn't really matter once Thor gets his hands on it. This is Mjolnir, an unbreakable hammer. It always hits its mark and always comes back to the hand that throws it, and for Thor, it's love at first sight. The rest of the Aesir agree, because with Mjolnir, Thor will always be able to protect them from giants. The Aesir announce that Brock and Atri's gifts are the best, and they're all happy, except for Loki, who totally dunked on himself. Thanks, Thought Bubble. Now that he's lost the bet, Loki starts sweating and making excuses to Brock, but Brock only pulls out his knife and starts talking about all the stuff he and his brother are gonna make, out of Loki's head. Increasingly desperate, Loki starts looking to the other gods for help, but no one's buying it. A bet's a bet, and Loki lost. Even after cheating, Loki thinks quick. He's got one more trick up his sleeve. Loki explains that yes, Brock does have a right to his head, but that the bet didn't include any part of his neck. So he's welcome to the head, but only if he can get it without cutting the neck. 
Brock calls shenanigans and appeals directly to Odin, but in perhaps the earliest example of getting off on a technicality, the one-eyed Allfather agrees with Loki, and Brock has to go home with his own head in his hands instead of Loki's. Classic trickster stories like these often involve serious transgressions against society. In this case, it's stealing, and not just from humans, but from other gods. Neither Loki nor Hermes has a good reason for their thefts either. In fact, their excuses are downright immature. I was drunk, and I'm a baby. Though, to be fair, both do end up presenting important gifts to their fellow gods, ones that become foundations of the stories told about them for millennia. Loki in particular shows us that while tricksters often get away with their tricks, the result is not always a foregone conclusion. Despite his best efforts, Loki is set to pay a stiff price for stealing Sif's hair, first at Thor's hands and then at Brock's. In both cases, it's only his wit that saves him. Like Anansi, Loki can talk his way out of a pickle and, in this way, provide a model for human behavior that other gods who rely on their supernatural gifts simply can't. Most of us don't have super strength or magic hammers, but we all have brains and the ability to solve problems, even if we're the ones who made those problems for ourselves in the first place. Just don't go trying to grift any rubes. You might not get lucky like Loki, and you could end up losing a little bit too much off the top. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Check out our Crash Course Mythology tote, tote bag, and poster, available now at dftba.com. Crash Course Mythology is filmed in the Chad and Stacey Emigold's studio in Indianapolis, Indiana, and is produced with the help of all of these very nice people. Our animation team is Thought Cafe. Crash Course exists thanks to the generous support of our patrons at Patreon. Patreon is a voluntary subscription service where you can support the content you love through a monthly donation and help keep Crash Course free for everyone forever. Crash Course is made with Adobe Creative Cloud. Check the description for a link to a free trial. Thanks for watching, and if I were brought in Atri, I would have given Loki's head to Samson. That's a man who knows how to use the jawbone of an ass.